very embarrassing for me to stand before you as someone who uh, self-professes to be uh, proficient in technology and I not figure out how to use the clicker. So thank you very much uh, for the crash course. Thank you for the warm welcome, uh, both to South Africa broadly, from the University of South Africa, uh, and to Sun City and to this wonderful conference. I have to say that I make no promises about being uh, provocative. I do make promises that I will be on my very best behavior, for I have come a very long way, and if I am not on my best behavior, uh, my family and friends will tell me about it upon my return. Speaking of my family and friends and from uh, where I come from, I would like to offer greetings not only on my personal behalf, but on behalf of a few others. So let me start there. On behalf of the Department of Sociology at Virginia Commonwealth University there in the U.S., I bring you greetings where we are discussing increasingly questions about inequality and stratification in the U.S. as it relates to higher education tends to be my focus area. I would like to thank Maxim for the wonderful introduction, the ministers for setting a stage for a conversation that I hope to deepen, to broaden, and to revisit, and a very special thank you to Paul Prinsloo for the uh, invitation to be here with you uh, this week. So let me tell you a little bit about myself, first of all, and hopefully explain why I'm here speaking to you. My question here for us today is about a word that we've already heard quite a bit about this morning, and it is a word that I wrestle with in my research as a sociologist, uh, that I think about a lot in my work as a writer and as an editor, and then just more broadly as I consider myself a citizen participant in sort of a larger civic project. I think about the question of access. And what does access mean? And more importantly, what does it not mean as we currently think about it? I like to call it the access paradox. And I would not be the only one to call it that. Some of the work that I'll be drawing on here today is classic sociological work about education, educational development. And one of the things that I hope to do in our conversations over the next few days is to bring this lens of sociology to some of the more pressing questions about expanding access to education, particularly through digital technologies and e-learning. And I want to start by saying I don't have any particular problems with the expansion of education. I do not have any particular problems with using digital technologies. I tend to use them. I occasionally work with people to develop them. Right now, my students uh, should be preparing for their exam that they will take when I return. But in the interim, they are participating with me in this conference by using the hashtags and participating with me on various blog projects. I use technology to further educational initiatives. So I come to you not as a non-believer or as a skeptic, but I come to you as a fuller scholar who has questions about inequality and what access can and cannot mean to those who, for whom it would matter the most. So the secondary question that I have there is, can education expansion balance access with equity, right? It is actually quite easy in the grand scheme of things, in the grand political scheme of things, to expand access, right? We can create content and we can put it on the internet. Access is easy. Mix, add water, and there is your access, right? I do not think, however, that we mean access as a goal unto itself, right? Generally, those of us who care about education, as I suppose all of us do in this room, are really asking a broader and deeper question about access. That is often implied, and one of the things I want to do today is to make that explicit. Right? And that is, what can access do for equity? What can access do for equality? And in my terminology, and the question that I'll leave you here with today is, what can access do for justice? Are these compatible goals? Right? I'll start with a, a few lessons and uh, a few definitions and hope that we are sharing the same language. The first is that when we are talking about educational access, we tend to be talking very broadly about various schemes designed to help those that are quote unquote underserved in some way, quote unquote disadvantaged, and we tend to mean that as sort of cumulatively and historically disadvantaged, whether it be through geography, we talked a bit here today about rural and urban divides, something that still persists in the US, I might point out, right? 
We are talking about race. We are talking about gender. I was very happy to hear the minister speak about gender disparities in higher education. Again, something that persists in the US. We are talking about social class and differences of income and wealth. We are talking about cultural inequalities when we talk about these historical cumulative disadvantaged groups. Depending on your national context, your local context, your hyper-local context, the groups may change. Right? The great benefit, however, of living in a global society is that I can take for granted that no matter where you are, there is such a group. Right? So the characteristics of that group may be different depending on where you are, but I think we all share a context where there is such a group, right? Uh, and that that group tends to become, tends to be trotted out when we talk about discussions of education, whether we mean the same group or not, we mean the same construct. That there is some group that has been left out of the expansion and the benefits and the returns to formal education. This is what we think educational access is about. Well, we know a few things from sociology. And for, let me be very clear, I was happy that the uh, minister was a sociologist. I am often the only one in the room, uh, <laughs> particularly rooms such as these. So it's always nice to have a tribe, right? The sociology of education has a bit to say about questions of access, expansion, and more particularly about questions of inequality among disadvantaged groups. So I want to start there about what I mean by the sociology of education. For at least 60 years, sociologists have studied education as an institution, as a process of credentialing, both formally and informally, certifying skills, abilities, and talents, but we do not just study the institution of education itself, and this is what I think is particularly salient for our conversations here over the next few days. We say that education as an institution is interrelated to other institutions and that they all work together, right? And that to understand one, you've got to understand the others, and more importantly, you have to understand how they interact with each other. One of the shortcomings increasingly in the U.S. as we, do, as we battle our own demons about educational expansion, uh, and the Minister Zamandi made the point, he said, I'm not sure how this works in other countries. Well, I could tell you a little bit about the U.S. We are dealing with some very similar issues. We have greater demand than we have the ability to expand our post-secondary institutions to meet that demand. Our response to that demand has primarily emerged out of the market sector, which is for-profit private institutions, whether that be virtual schools, charter schools, for-profit colleges and credentials or what have you, meaning it's happened among the markets as opposed to the state or the public sector. We too continue to struggle with how are we going to serve students who are older, who are overcoming the historical disadvantages of poor K through 12 preparation for higher education, who want vocational education and institutions rarely offer it, right? And we are struggling with how people will pay for that type of education. So our struggles are not that dissimilar. Sociologists of education consider these things as being problems in, uh, of the educational institution, but not just problems of the educational institution. When we are thinking about resources and ultimately mobility, meaning how much do disadvantaged groups have as compared to advantaged groups, the question we're really asking is what education can do and what it cannot do. What it can do and what it cannot do. So a few lessons from this very broad body of research. The first is that if you expand education in an unequal society, you will reproduce inequality. That's the takeaway. Almost no one disagrees with this. We may disagree to the extent to which this is true. We may disagree to the extent to which that constitutes a problem. But the literature says, if you expand education without attention to the unequal distribution of resources, education will become a vehicle for reproducing those inequalities. We call this qualitative differentiation, one of the ways that this plays out in the U.S. or has played out in the U.S. For us over the last 30 years, if we, as we saw an increase in demand for post-secondary or tertiary uh, education and uh, cred credentials and certificates, particularly for those who wanted to re-enter the job market through uh, changing vocational pathways, we did not create more prestigious universities to serve them. 
that actually rarely happens. Right. There is still only one Harvard in the U.S. Right. Despite the fact that more people would love that type of quality education. Instead, what we have, de what we devised was a secondary system of what we call in our language for-profit colleges and universities that offered access to degrees, to job training, but they did so at a high individual and social cost. Right? By expanding education without paying attention to the mechanisms by which we expanded it, we created a two-tier system of higher education where the most disadvantaged students pay the most for the least quality education. Right? This is the lesson we should take away from expanding credentials without an attention to equality. The second lesson, and I hate to be the one to tell you this, because there are a lot of people who will tell you differently, <laughs> but I've got a lot of people on my side. And that is educational expansion alone does not produce more and better jobs. I'm sorry. They, do, and they can go hand in hand, but this is not the relationship. This is not the cause and effect. Right? As we pay attention to developing, as we like to call it, human capital, skill development, skill ability, that is a wonderful goal in and of itself, but it does not necessitate without extra investment, extra institutional investment. The investment in education alone does not produce the job structure that actually facilitates upward social mobility. When we ask education to do this without the mechanisms for it to do it, we set educational expansion up to fail. Yeah. I happen to love education a bit too much to set it up that way. So for me, being honest is about saving the thing to which I'm most committed. I'm committed to education and what it can do, so I have to be honest about what it cannot do. So educational expansion, what we know from Sochaved, is that it cannot produce alone more and better jobs for disadvantaged groups. A third lesson is that public and private labor markets must be linked to skills and credentials for mobility to happen. Right. These things cannot happen in a vacuum. They very rarely happen incidentally. These types of things have to be affirmative and deliberate. So your minister spoke to the importance of infrastructure and the importance of governance, I would expand that to say that the importance of the civic sphere more broadly is important to making credentials matter for disadvantaged groups. What purpose does it serve to broaden access to education without broadening access to the labor market? Right? What would we be serving to do that? In the U.S., what we have found is that we create a permanently disadvantaged, overeducated, underemployed group of people who disproportionately happen to be black, female, and low income. Our fourth lesson from the sociology of education is that access to high quality education, and I use that deliberately and to echo the, early, the minister's earlier comments, must be affirmative for disadvantaged groups to benefit. Affirmative, what do we mean by affirmative? Well, if you come from the US, we have this dirty language about affirmative action, which upsets lots of people. All right, but I'll use it here. If you'd like to run me off later, that's fine. Affirmative means that we have to pay attention to the groups that have been historically disadvantaged in education, right? that you have to make up the difference in resource allocation for those groups through education. That does not happen by accident. Right? That happens through deliberate policy that invests in educational institutions and access among disadvantaged groups. Yes. That if you open up access without proportioning, uh, disproportionate access to those disadvantaged groups, you just reproduce their position of disadvantage. And five, if we think about moving through higher education as a process that will increasingly happen over the life course, which is what we are increasingly assuming will have to happen for a labor market to, uh, to be significantly educated to participate in the jobs that most of us cannot yet even imagine, much less train for. 
right? We have to do a sort of broad-based education as skills are becoming more outdated more rapidly due to technological change in the labor market. Those transition points are the most fragile in the pathway from long formal education, and they are most fragile for those from disadvantaged groups. If we care about persistence, meaning completion, if we care about the returns to education, which I would say include economic returns, but not just economic returns, there are social benefits to educational attainment. If we care about access, not just for the sake of access, but we care about access because we care about the value of education, then we have to pay significant attention to these transition points along those pathways. So what happens between secondary education and higher education? What happens if I start on a vocational track and at some point later in life want to return to a traditional university track? Right? What happens if I want to do a certificate, later do a degree, later do an advanced degree? It is those transition points right, that are the most vulnerable points and is most vulnerable for the most vulnerable students. So what is the promise of open and distance education? Again, I am a proponent of education being available to all who want it. I am a product of a library card and public library systems in the United States. I am the product of an affirmative justice program that emerged from the civil rights movement in the US that made my educational trajectory possible. I obviously believe then in education as a democratic good. I am a product of that democratic good. And so the ethos that undergirds the idea of open and distance education is one that I'm pretty well primed for, right? So if I am at all critical of the process, it is because I hope so much of it, right? Educational development and credentialing, the promise says that we can do this for students wherever they are to help them get wherever they want to be. And that to me is a pretty profound promise, right? It has within it the idea of autonomy, not just for individuals, but for groups. It has within it the idea of self-actualization, things that are difficult to monetize, but that are very important in the civic project. So not just what you know, but what kind of citizen you can be. Right? I think that is the promise of open and distance education. More practically, for those who have to actually deal in the world of how do we make that happen, the promise of open and distance education, as the minister referred to earlier, is that it's low cost to deliver. Yep. Right. Right. Not only is it low cost in the economic sense, but it has a low opportunity cost, right, because it can pre be produced once, distributed widely and broadly, that there's a low opportunity cost for students to participate. So one of the reasons why we see a concerted interest in things like open and distance education is precisely because the types of students that we serve have changed. What does it mean to pursue higher education when you are also responsible for family? When you must work, right? when you are working, when you plan to continue to work? These are increasingly the types of students that we serve and the promise of open and distance education is that we can lower the opportunity costs for those students to, to pursue formal education. And the other promise is that we can offer access not just to content, because content to me is not knowledge, right? These are two different things. Cognitively, we know them to be two different things. We can produce content. Knowledge tends to be a bit more labor intensive. Having access then not just to content, but to high quality instruction and curriculum. And I want to broaden that even a bit more to talk about something that we are starting to learn from our data in the US about open distance education. The process of learning is a social process. We know this now, right? I like to think we have long known it, but we remembered it now, right? The process of learning is social. So on the one hand, what we have with ICT technologies and with digital technologies and digital platforms is this fetishization of social. We are on social media. We use social reading, right? We 
uh, we process and disseminate news through social means, right? The word social is right there in the term, right? On the other hand, we are producing online and distance education curriculums that uh, for the most part do not pay attention to developing the social aspects of learning. Right? But it's the social aspects of learning that turn content into knowledge Right? by giving students the social networks to develop the framework, the cognitive framework, to turn information into knowledge and to apply that knowledge in their own lives. And it does something else, this function of education that is critical and vital to the health of a higher education ecosystem. And that is develop social networks and social cultures. We tend not to, to value that nearly as much as we do the instruction and curriculum, but students value it a great deal. Right? And labor markets reward it significantly. Right? So how do we take these tools that have developed within them these social frameworks and make them more robust in the educational system for whom it is particularly important are those disadvantaged student groups. Right? Social networks tend to be particularly valuable to them. And as of yet, our online and distance education programs do not value and have not invested in the infrastructure of developing those social networks to the extent that we do them in social gaming and social media. So I would say more broadly, how do we offer access that is both high quality in instruction and curriculum and in the idea of education more broadly, not just as a content delivery system, but as a social and integrated system of knowledge production. Here's a little something we have in common. Our roadblocks. Yeah. We are trying to do all of this in something that we call an unequal structure of opportunity. And that is an unequal structure of opportunity that tends to be defined by wealth. If we do not pay close attention to how we implement the promise and uh, the promise of open and distance education. What we have found in the US is that the benefits of open and distance education will accrue to wealth. Right. Students in the US who are most likely to enroll and persist in massive open online courses tend to be white, male, highly educated, and of high income precisely the types of students who have available to them a world of higher education opportunities. If we do not pay attention to those mechanisms, we reproduce the same wealth inequalities that produce that unequal structure of opportunity. Right? This is what we see playing out in the US with the development of open and distance education. I quote here Thomas Piketty, who just said recently that this is something that most countries have in common. It is not a good thing to share, but it is the reality that the concentration of wealth in South Africa is similar to that in the US and in Brazil, and that the majority of the wealth is held by a min minority of the population. If we expand educational access without attention to these differences in wealth, the benefits of open and distance education tends to accrue to those who need it the least. So then that leaves me with this question. Understanding these facts and these lessons from the sociology of education, understanding the landscape of the structure of opportunity that we hope open and distance education will contribute to, the question becomes, how can we move from access to justice? When the opportunity structure is unequal, when the groups within that opportunity structure have unequal access to resources, how do we move from access to justice? This is a personal question of mine. A personal interest is the one that animates my academic research and my public writing. That is to move us beyond saying, can we have more access to, ask, to asking access to what and for whom? Yeah, which is a slightly different question. So what I ask is can open, accessible, high quality, low cost instruction provide pathways to upward social, economic, and political mobility 
for the most disadvantaged students? Can we build that system? Yeah. While we are building platforms, and while we are building tools, and while we are building governance mechanisms, can we build a structure that unleashes the power of technology without leaving behind those who have already been left behind enough? I like to think so. But that is not where we are currently. As I pointed out in the US, the benefits of the open and distance delivery platforms have accrued to the most advantaged students, the typical MOOC participant being white, male, higher class, middle class learners with formal credentials and economic resources who are using those credentials to further their positions and economic positions that they already have. We do a much poorer job of turning these educational opportunities into entry points into the labor market for those who do not have that social class, that wealth, or that advantageous characteristic. In the US, open and distance education reinforces the salience of wealth, of parental income, of race, and gender, and educational attainment. Uh, my colleague uh, at MIT, Justin Reich, has a recent paper that shows that the schools in the U.S. that are most likely to use even open source materials, which we tend to think of as the gold standard, and for many reasons should, right, of access for unequal schools, what we find in the U.S. is that the schools with the most resources use the open resources the most. The least resource schools tend to use the proprietary systems. Yeah. So open data in and of itself, open platforms in and of itself does not overcome the unequal distribution of resources among schools. That's because it is not merely a technological problem but a political problem. Right? A political problem of which schools know about, have the infrastructure for, and the in-school resources to adopt open platforms. As it stands, without some affirmative policy to distribute those resources equally, what we find is that the schools that could have afforded to pay for the proprietary platforms use open source platforms, and the schools who cannot really afford to pay for, for proprietary platforms do not use those open platforms. So can, we, uh, can education expansion balance access with equality? It can if it understands that education cannot do it alone. That is my response. If we understand that education cannot do it alone, that tools do not do it alone, that all of these things operate in a political economy, and those of us who care about the tools, who care about the students, who care about education, cannot abscond from participating in the political economy of what we do. So there are a couple of things that I would say we know a few things about, a couple of lessons. One is a political lesson, and that is the affirmative distribution of open and distance educational resources to designated or disadvantaged communities has to be paired with economic investment in those credentials. Does it matter if you have the credential if it does not qualify you for employment in the public sector? if the government doesn't accept it for hire? Does it matter if you have the credential if it does not qualify you to move into a new degree program? Those are the types of partnerships that have to happen between public and private sector for the credentials to matter for the groups to whom it matters the most. The other would be economic. When I say legitimate credentials, I mean high quality, I mean those that have been considered certified as uh, requirements for points of entry into the labor markets and into post-secondary education. They have to be paired with affirmative hiring in both the public and the private sector. Right? We tend to shuttle a lot of this off to the private sector who has not been very responsive I might add, in the US especially, has not been very responsive to accepting these credentials as sufficient for employment. As it turns out, we're fortunate, though, 
we do still have public sectors, we do still have a government, and we do still have states, and they do still employ people. So what are our states doing to legitimize the credentials that we're producing might be another question. The final economic point being that public and private sector subsidies for continued education, especially tertiary education, has to be put on the map. How are people going to pay for this over the life course? What mechanism do we have in place for them to pay for the credentials over the life course? Without answering that question, we end up with the situation that we have in the US, which is significant student loan debt, an overproduction of credentials, and low returns to educational attainment for the most vulnerable students. I've made the PowerPoint available online on the website and the hashtag on Twitter. It has a wonderful resource there at the end. And I'll leave you with this. Who among us will be the keeper, not just of openness and of distance, but of justice as we build tools for open education? Thank you for having me. Yes, sir.